all the way from Armidale. Reagan has got a word from the Lord. Put your hands together as he comes up to preach. God bless you, Reagan. I am so looking forward to this. May the Lord bless you. God bless you, brother. Pastor Dave, don't run away. Uh oh. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to bring God's word this morning. I feel such a strong spirit of confirmation. I just want you to read. I'm going to my WhatsApp here. Don't do that often. This was the SMS message from my father-in-law this morning as I was driving to work. Do you want to just read that? On your phone? On my phone. Just that message, not the other messages. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you, Rochelle. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just, oh, yeah, I can see it. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. So I responded to Uncle, thank you so much for those cherished, cherished scriptures, Uncle and Auntie. They were a delight and the repeated mentioning of fire for a confirmation on our way to church, thanking you again for your prayers. Love and God bless. Praise God. Amen. Am I, am I on now? You're, you're on. So God bless you, everybody. The Lord's speaking to us today. So let's just listen carefully. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, it's 2022. Well, it's past the halfway mark. We're nearing the seventh, conclusion of the seventh month. And 2021 was a year filled with challenges. And 2022 just felt like we sort of went one notch above. We had the challenges of COVID. We've also had the challenges of inflation. Rising prices from fuel to food. And the challenges are not just Australia, but globally. And I'd like to bring to you a message from the Lord. A message to just strengthen us, to encourage us, to equip us to finish this year strong. Pastor David, before he left, he asked me what I would be preaching on. And I said, well, I didn't really know. And then he asked me, or Rochelle asked me, would you rather be given a topic or choose a topic yourself? And I said, well, it really depends what the topic is that I'm given. <laughs> As long as it's not mental health. <laughs> but the Lord has a sense of humor. <laughs> and today I'd like to bring to you a message that touches on the landscape and the spectrum of mental health. You know, a disclaimer, I'm not an expert in mental health. I'm not a professional in mental health. I have no credentials. I'm not accredited, I'm not certified. But this morning, I'd like to refer to someone who is an expert, a master in this field. His wisdom has no bounds, has no limits. His knowledge is infinite. His insight is life-giving. And he has something to say on the subject of worry. You know, we faced many challenges this year. Challenges that could have been economic, challenges that could have been health, ca challenges that could have been relationship, challenges of various sorts. But amongst all these challenges, there's often a common denominator. And that common denominator is a denominator of worry. If you turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34... Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. If you have the NIV Bible, this portion is probably entitled in your Bibles, Do Not Worry. Well, I'd like to bring to your message entitled, Do Not Worry. Well, it has a subheading that's a bit longer, but the subheading contains the body or the outline of this message. A command to obey. A joy to encounter. We sang so many worship songs today that echoed joy, yeah. confirming the word of the Lord. Yeah. A command to obey. A joy to encounter. And Pastor Dave, a promise to take hold of. A command to obey. 
a joy to encounter, and a promise to take hold of. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. I won't actually read the whole passage. It's a passage that we're very familiar with. But in this passage, Jesus mentions three times, therefore, do not worry. Therefore, do not worry. And if you didn't get it, he said it a third time. Therefore, do not worry. Jesus gives examples of why not to worry. But in this passage, Jesus diagnoses worry and gives a remedy for worry. What is worry? I thought about it and thought about it. And then I realized that the simplest of definitions is best. Worry is being anxious for the future. Worry is being anxious of the future. Now, worry is not planning for the future. Worry is not preparing for the future. But worry is being anxious for the future. Jesus did not say, do not worry what you'll eat and drink. If your fridge is empty, if you have no food, don't go to Aldi, don't go to Coles. You can just starve. He was not saying that. Jesus did not say, oh, don't worry what you'll wear. If you haven't done your laundry, no worries, mate. Uh, you can just go to work tomorrow with no clothes. That would be quite horrendous. <laughs> Jesus was not saying, do not plan. You know, Jesus himself was a great planner. Jesus himself was a great planner. You know, he fasted for 40 days in the wilderness before he encountered Satan. I wonder if he knew what was coming, but he fasted for 40 days. He planned. You know, Jesus, his ultimate mission was to go to the cross and to die for your sins and mine, yeah. to pay the price that we could not pay, to conquer death by rising again on the third day. Yeah. He planned to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray before he fulfilled his greatest mission. Yeah. You know, Jesus planned his earthly ministry. For three years, he had a public ministry. He planned for three years to have a public ministry. He planned for those three years to call 12 disciples to walk closely with him. He planned to spend time with them, to nourish them, to nurture them, to equip them, to empower them so that they may go forth and tell the name of Jesus to all nations from Jerusalem to Judah, from Jerusalem to Judah to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world so that we may know and celebrate the risen Savior. Jesus was a great planner. Jesus is a great planner. Jesus is planning heaven, building mansions for his children. You know, Jesus was and is a great planner. God is a great planner. God planned creation in six literal days. He planned to rest on the seventh day. He planned to send his son, Jesus Christ, the only begotten, to die on the cross. He planned for there to be redemption. He planned for there to be restoration. He planned that a fallen man and a holy God can be reunited by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God was a great planner. God was a great planner. And God has a great plan for you. And his plan is that you not enter into worry. His plan is that you not enter into anxiousness. His plan is that you enter into his peace and rest and walk in all that he has for you. There is a command to obey. Do not worry. Do not worry. Worry, someone said, is like a rocking chair. It swings back and forth, is always occupied, but goes nowhere. Worry does not plan or prepare for the future. Worry is tomorrow's problems brought forward today. Worry is tomorrow's problems brought forward today. Tomorrow's problems that are often unlikely to happen, often untrue, Problems that are often characterized by the phrase, what if this happens or that happens. Worry is like a rocking chair. Worry is tomorrow's problems brought forward today. Worry tries to control the uncontrollable. 
Worry is like a Christian who is a farmer. He prepares the ground, he tills the ground, he sows seeds into the ground. But he is not worried about the weather because the weather is the Lord's. Nor is he even worried about the harvest, for the harvest belongs to the Lord. Amen. We've looked at what worry is, being anxious for the future. And worry is not planning for the future. But I'd like us to unpack worry further, to understand why worry is such a danger. It's subtle, can creep into our minds, and can cause havoc. Three dangers of worry. Number one, worry focuses on the problem. Worry focuses on the problem and not the power of God. Worry focuses on the problem. It magnifies the problem. It is consumed by the problem. It is paralyzed by the problem. Someone said, if you have a big problem, you probably have a small God. But if you have a big God, all your problems are small. Worry puts you in the wrong perspective and the wrong focus. Worry, in fact, takes God, who should be at the very center of your heart and mind, uproots God, displaces God, and places Him at the back of your mind. Worry gives you a diminished, distorted image of God, His person, His character, and His power. A person who is worried does not see that God is a mighty fortress. For at his time when he needs shelter and refuge. A person who's worried does not see God as the rock of ages when all is shaking and the storms are about to blow. A person who's worried does not see God as the good shepherd who guides at a time of confusion. A person who's worried does not see God as the healer at a time of sickness. A person who's worried does not see God as the restorer who gives you a double portion when you've been robbed and stolen. A person who's worried does not see God as the one who is the prince of peace who can drive away all fear and anxiety. A person who is worried has the wrong focus. He focuses on the problem and fails to see the power of God. But a person who's worried, it gets worse. A person who's worried not only has the wrong perspective, but worry destroys faith. Worry is not a faith builder. Worry is a faith destroyer. Worry is a faith destroyer. In that passage in Matthew 6, Jesus diagnoses worry. Yes, he, he, he says, do not worry. He gives examples of of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. And he says, look, your heavenly father is looking after the birds of the air. They do, not, they do not even sow or reap or gather food for their barns and the lilies of the field. Well, look, even Solomon is not clothed in such splendor. But then he gets to the crux of the matter. He gets to the core of issue with worry when he says, O ye of little faith. You know, Jesus gives the story of the parable of the sower where there is the farmer who sows seeds. The farmer is God. The seeds are the word of God, and he sows it on different types of ground. One of those grounds, it's always hard to remember all those four types of grounds, isn't it? I always have to look back at the Bible. But one of those types of grounds is thorny ground. So the farmer, God sows seed into the thorny ground. You know, it sprouts up for a while, but then it is choked by the thorns. And what are those thorns? They are thorns of worry cares of this world that chokes faith. Worry is a faith destroyer. Pastor Rick Warren and uh, John Hagee both have strong words to say about worry. They distill worry in these words. They're sort of big words. Don't, don't lose me. Let's think through it. They call worry practical atheism. Practical atheism. It's one thing to profess Christ. But it's another thing to practice Christ at a time of trial and challenge. When the worries come, are we overwhelmed with worry or are we moving in faith? I believe faith is something that has to be lived, experienced, and encountered. It can't be even taught in a sermon, but it has to be embraced 
personally in your own walk with the Lord. I was 13 years old. At 10, I left Sri Lanka due to the civil unrest. My last school faced an explosion. And so my dad's promptly dispatched me off. And, and so at a young age, my little girl is nine, I can't imagine, at 10, leaving to a boarding school, getting on a plane. Three years later in the boarding school, well, I got used to the school. We had lots of activities. One of the activities was cross-country race. I, I always played sport. I wasn't the best, but I was good enough to qualify. And so I, I qualified for this cross-country race. It was an interesting race. They had a skid track, I remember, which is when you go down the slippery hills in Uti. Uh, you had the box walk, which is very steep. Uh, you might as well walk it. It's so steep. Uh, there are areas where you go through the remote villages of India. It was a challenging race. On this particular day, I felt something was not right with my body. I went to the school clinic and I said, can you just check me out? And they said, you're fine. You better go run. I started the race. I more like walked it. Three quarters of the race, I walked. By God's grace, I finished the race. But when I finished the race, I was a different person. My brain was attacked. I was disoriented. I walked into walls. I couldn't undress. I couldn't even identify my own room in the dormitory. My friends first thought I was playing a prank, but then they realized something's not right with Regan. I was taken back to the school clinic. I recalled uh, oxygen masks being put on me, though I don't think I was struggling to breathe. Uh, I was then carried and put into a school jeep. Uh, my brother carried me, and I was sent to the nearest hospital, a Cortigary hospital. I remember being taken out of the jeep and put on a wheelchair and pushed down this long corridor. And I know at that moment, I lost all consciousness, and I went into a coma. The school principal was shocked, he said. He said he's never seen 10 nurses taken to pin down this small boy, for I had fierce, aggressive convulsions. The doctors saw me, and they quickly said, this patient is too critically ill. We cannot treat a patient like this. If you want a chance to save him, send him to Coimbatore. I was taken to a hospital called Sri Ramakrishna in Coimbatore. <coughs> the doctors saw me. And the doc of course, I was in a coma. <coughs> the doctors said, they did the scan of my brain. My brain was devastated, destroyed. They said, this boy will not live three days. If he lives three days, and if he even wakes out of his coma, he will not recognize his own parents. My parents were in Sri Lanka. They have obviously had told the news, and they got emergency visas and came. Their faith would now be tested. Their faith would be on trial. My father was a man who faced many challenges. He ran, he ran the Uli Sri Lankan Cheese Company. He had more than 100 workers. He had dealt with all kinds of situations from riots to whatnot. He was a calm, cool, collected individual. But when he was told by the doctors bluntly that his son would die, he said, if my son dies, I'll be a madman. <clears throat> my mom was, was a woman who was very traditional. She didn't have... She was confined to the house, to domestic duties. She didn't have much challenges as dad would have had to carry. But she was a man, she was a woman of prayer. And she prayed. And she was not moved. She did not have a distorted image of the living God. She believed in a God who could do the impossible. She believed in a God who could heal. She believed in a God who could raise the dead to life. And she prayed. And she was not moved. On one morning, mom was getting dressed to come into the intensive care unit. And my brother looked at her and said, what are you doing, mom? What are you getting dressed for? You're not going for a wedding. You're going for a funeral. It was a reality that I would die. The school got down on their knees. On the third day, the principal spoke to the whole student body and said, well, Regan's last day is today. Let's get down on our knees and pray. They prayed, 
and I woke out of my coma. The first words of the doctors, I had neurosurgeons and neurologists, I had six doctors probably in the best hospitals of India, but the first words of those doctors were, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. You know, faith has to be encountered. Worry destroys faith, but trials build faith. Worry destroys faith, but trials build faith. Worry destroys faith. Worry gives us a wrong perspective of God. And thirdly, worry breeds fear. Worry breeds and instills fear. Dr. David Jeremiah says that fear and worry are identical twins. I say worry is the very womb and mother of anxiety. Worry is where anxiety is birthed. We've looked at the dangers of worry. We've looked at what not to do. Let's go ahead and look at what we should do when trials come our way, when challenges come our way, when problems come our way, when rocks come our way. What do we do? We move from a place of worry to a position of worship. We move from a place of worry to a position of worship. You know, the best passage or one of the best passages about worry, about anxiety, as you said, Pastor Bethwin, is Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 from verse 6. But you know, Paul sets the stage a few verses before. In Philippians 4 verse 6, it says, do not, worry, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. But he sets the stage two verses before when he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. How do we worship? I think three ingredients for worship. The first ingredient is joy. Joy. Because joy extinguishes worry. But you say, how can I be joyful? My son is dying in the ICU. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Nehemiah 8 verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if you're struggling to find that joy, pray like the psalmist, Lord, restore the joy of my salvation. If you can't find joy, run to God. In your presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 16, verse 11. But you say, Regan, there are trials, trials that are, that are crushing me down. Well, James says, consider it all pure joy when you fall into trials. Well, what's the mystery to obtaining joy when the fire is burning around you? What's the secret Joy is not happiness. Joy is not happiness. Joy is not built on circumstances. Joy is not defined by challenges. But joy is found in the person of Jesus Christ and in the confidence that he is in control and that he is supreme and that he will make all things perfect according to his sovereign will. That is the mystery of joy. How do you worship? You worship with joy. How else do you worship? You worship in prayer. You worship in prayer. You know, when you face challenges, I'm not saying don't deny your challenges. You cannot deny your challenges. When you have mountains, I'm not saying don't deny your mountains. You have to accept that there's a mountain in front of you. But believe that in your trial, you can be an overcomer. Believe that you can speak to the mountain and you can move the mountain in faith. Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. You know, turn your worry list into a prayer list. Turn your worry list into a prayer list. Worrying. Prem, my wife had a post, and I said, send it to me in WhatsApp. 
her post was, Worry is you talking to yourself about the problems you cannot change. But prayer is talking to God about the things he can change. So all credit to Prayer Mini Joseph for that one. <laughs> Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. How do you worship? You find joy. How do you worship? You enter into prayer. Prayer is a powerful weapon. Strongholds come tumbling down and down. How do you worship? You worship by giving him your whole heart. Jesus not only diagnoses worry when he says, Oh, you have little faith in Matthew chapter 6, but he also gives the remedy for worry when he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. See, Jesus said the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Worship him with your heart. How do we overcome worry? We overcome worry by moving from a place of worry to a position of worship that enthrones God in our hearts. But to overcome worry, I like to take a two-pronged strategy. We need to attack worry on two fronts, the eastern front and the western front. We've got to attack worry both in the heart and in the mind. Because Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind. Worry is something that enters and creeps into the mind. Someone said the battlefield of the mind, the battlefield of sin is in the mind. The battlefield of sin is in the mind. Sin is subtle and creeps into our mind. No wonder Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. <clears throat> Give me a second here. How do we guard our mind? Pastor Dave, we talked about being anchored on the promises of God. A promise for each of us to take hold of, for each of us to seize. We guard our mind by anchoring ourselves on the promises of God. You know, the people of Egypt, God's people. In Genesis, we read that they were given a promise. And there's a promise for each of us as we did at the communion table. The people of God were given a promise. It was a promise, literally, of a promised land. We go to the book of Exodus, and we see that they're not in a promised land, but they're in a land of bondage. They're enslaved to the Egyptians. But we see God extend his mighty arm. They saw God do miracles. They saw God do ten plagues. They saw God pass the Red Sea. They, got, they saw God lead them through a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. They saw God provide food. They saw all of God's mighty works so that God was setting the stage so that they could enter into their promise. But what did they do? They moved for, to a place of worry. They moved to a place of worry. A promise that they could enter into less than two weeks or 11 days took them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness because they may put themselves in a place and position of worry. Only Joshua, Caleb, and those who were 20 years younger could enter and inherit the promises that God has for you. You know, God has promises for you. Are we going to wander in the wilderness or are we going to claim the promises that the Lord has for us? I want you to claim your own promises. I don't want to give you promises that belong that would be like trespassing, but I want to give I want you to enter into his word. At a time of trial, at a time of challenge, seek the Lord. Give it a shot. Open the Bible. Rub off the dust. Be disciplined. Carve some time out and say, "Lord, this trial, this challenge is yours. Speak to me." But I'll give you one freebie promise from Philippians 1.6. Consider it a freebie. He who began a, a, work, a good work in you will complete it to the end. As I close, as I close this morning, I'm not, I'm, 
I'm doing good for time, Pastor Dave. I'd like to leave with you two pictures. Two pictures. Picture words. The first is the word worry. The word worry is being anxious for the future, but it's a colorful, picturesque word. The picture of the word worry is of one who's pulled in different directions. Pulled in different directions, resulting in you being fragmented, shattered, and destroyed. Worry is when you're pulled apart in different directions, leaving you shattered, destroyed, and demolished. But the second word is the word trial. The word trial. Our connect groups have been starting to explore the book of James. And in James, the author, the half-brother of Jesus, a senior pastor in Jerusalem, he writes to those who are scattered, to the Christians, the Jewish Christians who are scattered, who had to leave Palestine because of intense persecution. He writes to them, and these people are going through extreme hardships. He writes, count it all joy when you fall into Diverse trials. The word trials is interesting. It's the second word, the picture word for us this morning. The word trials is a picture of a refiner who takes the metal and silver. He takes a hammer, actually, and breaks it up into small bits. He puts that metal into a melting pot. Underneath the melting pot is a furnace. He heats the furnace to just the right perfect temperature. And the metal liquidifies. The impurities rise to the top. The refiner takes the impurities. He scoops them out and throws them away. And then he looks into that melting pot and he heats the fire even more. And more impurities rise to the top. He scoops those impurities and throws them away. The refiner does this a few repeatedly until the refiner looks into the melting pot and he's able to see a spitting image, an impression, an imprint, his own image on pure silver. The melting pot are the trials of life. The refiner is God. You are are the silver. God wants to complete the good work he started in your life. In Genesis, we read that God said, let us make man in our image. That image has been tarnished. But God is a God who restores. God is a God who completes. God is a God who perfects. He wants to deposit his power, his anointing, his glory in your life. May the Lord bless his word. Do not worry. Do not be anxious for anything. Overcome worry with worship. Overcome worry by anchoring on the promises of God. The Lord bless you.